Okay, hello everyone. Um, how's everyone doing? Everyone happy? <laughs> so we're at the end of the day here, and uh, we'll be doing uh, development of blockchain industries. You've seen some interesting talks today, um, but one of the areas that is not as well known is that there's actually, on the enterprise side, and many different industries, um, there's a, a lot of activity. Obviously, on the crypto side, things are quiet. Um, what we've been hearing is we have crypto winter, and, um, but then we have spring in enterprise blockchain. Um, and that includes areas like uh, fintech, and also healthcare and um, other industries like supply chain and logistics. So let me just uh, start out here um, by doing a couple introductions. My name is Jordan Woods, and I'll be your moderator for this session. And then we have uh, Satya Bajpai, uh, who's from JMP Securities, um, Radhika Iyengar Emmons, who's from Starchain Ventures. We have David Himes uh, from Oracle, and uh, most of you probably know Chandler Guo uh, from Bitcoin God. Um, so I'll let each of the um, you know, panelists introduce themselves a little bit more fully, and then we'll get into the discussion. Uh, Chandler, did you want to start? Okay. Uh, just with an uh, intro. Uh, intro for yourself. Okay. I'm a Bitcoin miner before. I do a lot of stupid things before. Uh, buy a lot of the altcoin. Uh, invite a lot of the altcoin. Right now, the uh, I'm almost selling all of the altcoin, become a Bitcoin. Right now, I'm totally 100% a Bitcoiner. Um, I work. I I just travel around the all the Asia, Indian market, and uh, later I will share share more information about the, about Bitcoin. It's time to buy or sell, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chandler. David? Hi, I'm David Hames. Uh, I work for Oracle and particularly in our applications division. So we build applications for things like supply chain, HR, and all the things that our customers, large businesses, need to run their business. Um, so I come to blockchain looking at the technology to see um, and figure out the best way to slide that into our technology stack and how it will disrupt our existing applications today. Hi, I'm uh, Radhika Inger Emmons. I'm a founding partner at Starchain Ventures and also managing partner of Double Nova Group, um, raising a fund that is focused on uh, enterprise blockchain and foundational protocols. Uh, very bullish on the technology side of things, um, particularly on the enterprise side. So I think it's going to be a, a, a great ride for permissions chains, for enterprise, for foundational protocols. I'm also a digital health expert, so I, uh, I'm really seeing great applications within healthcare. Um, and to David's point as well on supply chain, uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, the supply chain for pharma is a, a great use case. So I'll be happy to share those views on the panel today. Hi, I'm Satya Bajpai. I'm with JMP Securities. Uh, we focus on investment banking for technology companies. And one of my role is to focus on blockchain as a sector and sort of evangelize it with our corporate enterprise customers and also institutional investors. A lot of my time is spent uh, telling them how they should think about enterprise uh, blockchain and institutional investing in blockchain. Uh, most, most of the questions that we get are on valuation or on how do you think about this business token versus actual equity of the business and so on. So I'm more on the finance side versus on the operations and that's what I focus on. Great. And uh, my name is Jordan Woods. Um, I am also with uh, Double Nova Group, which is a blockchain advisory and star chain ventures, uh, which uh, Radhika has already spoken about. Um, I'm a Caltech trained astrophysicist, so I saw the uh, real power of the mathematical underpinnings of blockchain as something that could create a layer of trust um, that is missing in, in the internet. 
and therefore has the potential to create a new foundation. And every time you have the creation of a new foundation, um, you have the potential for disruption. So um, what I'd like to do now is really get into um, a discussion about what is the real power of blockchain. I've you know, started out here by saying it's a trust layer. It's a, a layer uh, that can build uh, relationships peer to peer uh, that we really have never had before. We've always had trusted intermediaries. But I'd really like to ask this of the panel, you know, why is blockchain a great technology for business? And Satya? Maybe I'll start and kick off the discussion and I'll take a little bit of extreme position. So I don't know whether people will agree or disagree, but I really think blockchain is a technology which has three or four technologies built in it. But the most important thing is blockchain is just a technology. It does not create value by itself. A business is what creates value by using blockchain effectively. So you don't sell blockchain to customers. If I go and tell my mom and dad that go buy blockchain for $5, they're not gonna pay that money. But if I say, take this service, take this product, it'll help your life, they will buy it. And if it's using blockchain, and if blockchain helps you achieve the value in, in a cheaper or a more efficient way, then black blockchain creates value. So that's, that's my take, but uh, different people can, uh, can disagree. Um, I think that's part of the, the, the answer, I think. Uh, creating value is, is really important. And the way you can create value is by way of solving some really great pain points. So in, in enterprise, um, in businesses, uh, people are concerned about two major things. How do I make more money and how do I reduce my costs? So to Satya's point, if you're bringing efficiencies, let's say in supply chain or in logistics, that's an important value. Uh, but there are other values. Uh, for example, uh, when you look at blockchain itself as a technology, you're re really creating that layer of trust, like what Jordan was talking about. So trust and transparency are very important for most businesses. A lot of businesses look at the way things are run, and data is not freely available. It's not shareable across the supply chain, for example. So in pharmaceuticals, what we're seeing is there's a great problem of counterfeit drugs globally. That's about a $200 billion problem globally. So if you think about what um, it has as an effect on businesses within that chain, it's not just understanding where the problem is arising and pinpointing the origin of that problem. It's also understanding the impact it has on human lives. So if human lives are lost or people get sick, which people do, nearly 30% of the drugs worldwide are counterfeit. So this is something that blockchain can really address by building that trust layer across the supply chain, helping people identify where the problems are because you're tracking the drug from the point when it's conceived of all the way through to commercialization and beyond. So these are some of the problems that we're seeing in enterprise is being able to solve fundamental problems of trust and transparency, preserving privacy and confidentiality of data. That's really an important thing. So that's, I think that's where the value comes from. So not, not too much controversy, because I would agree it is a technology. But trust is something that typically we don't find a technology, or we haven't found a technology yet that I've seen that provides trust in the way the blockchain technology does. And, and when I came across it many years ago, I, I was fascinated by it. And I've been fascinated by the Bitcoin blockchain and what it's done and, and how it's worked. It has worked, I guess. but. Coming from an enterprise point of view, trust is a very different thing. What you know, the crypto world's trying to do is disrupt banks, governments, central banking institutions. That's not really something, at least in my day job, <laughs> not something <laughs> I'm interested in. Um, but the trust that enterprises need is, like for example, trust that this tablet that I'm about to take, you know, I, can I prove where it's come from? If you look at supply chain use cases, there's plenty of them. We see on the TV, people talk about, oh, I want to know that my coffee beans are organic. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of organic, but I'm more concerned about, are the airbags in this car that I'm driving my kids to school in this morning, do they have proper parts in, and have we had got any recalls on those parts? And, you know, that's a problem. There's a, 
a major auto manufacturer that had to recall, I think it's over three million cars now because of a few ten thousands of faulty components in airbags. They just didn't know which cars they were in. And then also they found that the, in, we ha they hire um, you know, independent quality companies to do tests and check them. Well, it turned out that somebody had falsified those records. So suddenly I can't trust anything. So that's one example of trust in tracking you know, things through a supply chain. But if you look at banks are investing in blockchain as a technology very heavily. And the reason is they do million, hundreds of millions of transactions a day with each other. And at the end of the day, bank A says, I think you owe me 200 million to bank B. And bank B says, no, I think it's 200 million and one. <laughs> and you see those large towers that the banks and in trouble here. <laughs> Many of those floors are people combing through transactions to try and find out. It's not one transaction for one dollar. It's many transactions that we rounded slightly differently or a currency rate that we use wrong. So it's a total nightmare. So when we talk about trust, it's not so much trust that, you know, I don't trust you to pay me. It's trust that I'm not sure I can trust you to correctly record all these transactions. So what we bring with the data we share the data. It's both of ours data with what, whatever we're trading, whether it's the pharmaceutical through my supply chain or whether it's financial transactions between the two of us or multi-parties. We all own that data and we all want to trust it. And that's where it's very exciting from an enterprise point of view. Before I ask a question, I want to ask a question. Who have Bitcoin here? Raise your hand. Okay. Only, only like a 10? If you have Bitcoin, raise your hand. Okay. Maybe 20, maybe 10. Okay. Oh. <laughs> a lot of people think of blockchain is kind of the good technology. Uh, and this is a good story to raise money to the entrepreneur, to start up, right? So last year and this year, Almost a lot of company jumping to blockchain area want to raise money easily because of ICO, right? But for a lot of people who don't know that it's history, they don't know why, why the blockchain is such a hot, right? Uh, actually, the, I just uh, spent three months travel around all Asia and uh, to find the reason why is that. So. After, after I find the real reason, the true story, you cannot believe that. It's a Ponzi game. You know? It's a Ponzi game start using the Bitcoin, using the Ethereum to, the, um, to transfer money to, to, to do the Ponzi game, name the money game. In all the Malaysia, Indonesia, all these countries, have a lot of the Asia, have a lot of Asia from Chinese, China. They are the Asia, they are Chinese. There's like a three generation of Chinese. They're moving to the uh, in the Malaysia. This kind of group of people, they're doing the pounding game. Definitely is illegal, right? They are doing the very big pounding game. They can read in the one billion dollar just ten minute, ten minute. Why a lot of people jumping their pounding game? because they give you 1% of the interest every day. 1% interest every day. And there's a lot of people crazy on that. Before that, they are using the very easily to using the WeChat or Alipay to raise money in China. Because the fiat currency is easy to raise. But after the 2017, they were difficult to raise from the online. So they changed their idea using Bitcoin and Ethereum to raise the money. The biggest one named the MMIM. Do you know MMM Bank? It's a pounding game. They're only reading the Bitcoin. You can transfer money. You can read in Bitcoin. It, they can read in Bitcoin and they give you 1% interest every day. And secondly, secondly the pounding game is the Ethereum trade, which is started in the Shenzhen. Millions of the people jumping that pounding game. They make the Ethereum price like a hundred times. In last year, and after the pounding game, all the entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley, 
in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, all the people think, oh, blockchain is a big story. They can do the ICO. Then everyone do the ICO on the ERT20 on the Ethereum. So that's why today, like this, everyone crazy on that. But after the pony game, you know, stop, they're, they need to cash out. They, can, they sell the Bitcoin, become the USD tether. Then the money, the, the, the price of the, all the market price crash of, because of Bitcoin price crash to $6,000. Then all the altcoin almost go, go to zero. Ethereum, like a, a today only a $200, right? They will be keep, keep, keep down, keep down. Uh, Chandler, can so, I just ask you another question about that? Okay. So a lot of these are the public chains, right? Yeah. The Ethereum and the um, and Bitcoin, okay. right? They're, they're the public chains. And so people can freely buy them, right, on the exchanges. Mm -hmm. ha have you seen information or have you, are you familiar with the permissioned chains like Hyperledger Fabric or um, some of the others, like maybe uh, VeChain, Vilian? Do you know, do you no, know no, no, VeChain? No, no, no. They kind of have a thousand of different names of the different blockchain, right? Yeah. Or public chain or self chain or whatever chain, mm. supply chain. But for normal people, they don't know other chain. They don't know Ethereum, actually. They only know the Bitcoin. Mm. Bitcoin is only thing, the first thing they, they know, you know. So for all the market, only here, very have smart people like here. People can understand what what we are talking about. Yeah. But in, if you go to, if you go to the real world, you know, real world people only know Bitcoin. They, they, can, know they just buy Bitcoin, no matter how pricey that. Sure. So so I think Bitcoin today the Bitcoin is sixteen percent of the all the crypto value, sixteen percent. Mm -hmm. You know, well we keep growing to seventy percent to the eighty percent, ninety percent. So Bitcoin is everything. I travel around the that Asia market is crazy to buy Bitcoin. A lot of rich people they buy Bitcoin and keep buying. Yeah. They don't they don't trust their government. They don't trust the bank. Sure. That's why they buy Bitcoin. So for me, I I, I just tell you something you should know here. Um, you should buy Bitcoin, <laughs> and you don't need to buy more. You know, because in this world only have 21 million Bitcoin, and they almost lost 4 million Bitcoin. Right, and still have a, a kind of four million not mining right now. So in this world, if you hear people want to be rich in the future, you just buy one bitcoin because one bitcoin in the future will be one million dollar, mm -hmm. and all whole world GDP will be on that. Well, well, thank you for that. And David, can you tell us yeah. uh, your thoughts on the permissioned versus the public? Yeah, so, so, yeah, I I would disagree with that. Um, <laughs> And I'll tell you, just to finish on that, then I'll answer your question. Most businesses, I talk to a lot of our customers, biggest businesses around the world, many of them. People want less currencies, not more currencies. And why do they want that? Why do we have all the countries in Europe consolidate, or most of them, apart from my own country, the UK, um, going to the euro? Because it's not so much because of changing currencies, it's just an unpredictability. People don't really want more currencies, and they don't want them because they don't want unpredictability. So to try and introduce a new currency with absolutely no controls and call it crypto and expect that enterprises are going to jump on that and start using it, I think is very far-fetched. Now, to your point, right, what customers are talking about is permission blockchains. Right? Now, permission doesn't mean private. Permission means it's maybe a consortia that will set up this blockchain network. And if you sign up, sign some basic contract that you'll behave nicely, then I can join that network. And suddenly, I don't need to have proof of work. I don't need mining. I can have much faster throughput. And I don't need tokens to power the transactions because everyone who's signing up to join is going to get a benefit from it. And they're happy to pay the money to run the nodes. Um, because they'll get business benefit. And I think that's where the future is, at least for the enterprise space. Radhika, how about in healthcare? Thanks. Um, I, li I, li I think I'll add a little bit to what David was alluding to, because in healthcare, um, I think there's 
not only the benefits that David talked about in terms of having permission chains where you've got uh, validated nodes on the network. These are trusted nodes on the network. Um, and the data sharing across those nodes can be much more trusted and therefore it'll happen much more frequently. So one of the big issues we have in healthcare is the lack of shareability of data. So if we can get more trust into the data stream and have trusted nodes contributing to that and sharing the important data across the network, we'll actually be able to pull up more contextualized information about patients, for example. Um, I will disagree with David, though, on the token aspect because I think that while the main purpose may not be the tokenization aspect, the benefit of having the token is to incentivize behavior. So I do think that there are some opportunities that enterprise hasn't yet started to fully explore, but is open to. And I think that it, when you're talking about what are ways to incentivize behaviors, um, the tokenization and gamification of that behavior is, is something that I think is very valuable, um, particularly in something like healthcare. Um, so it's not just tokenizing our behaviors and saying we should be more healthy in our behaviors and choosing good behaviors and you know, not choosing bad behaviors, but it's also within enterprise, talking about all of the different stakeholders within that ecosystem being incentivized to do the right thing in the right way by their patients, for example. And Satya? My point here is uh, whether you go permission or not, it really, it's about one value. So I'll just give you an example. Uh, in Thailand, people went from land, uh, people went from no phones to mobile phones just because they completely skipped the landline phone uh, uh, economy that we had in US. Similarly, right now, there are a lot of countries in the world that people have no bank at all. And if there is a solution, be it crypto, be it permissioned, that can really create a banking platform for them or an insurance platform for them, I think that's what they really need. We sitting in US with five credit cards and two bank accounts don't appreciate that problem. But people who are saving their money in their backyard, they really care about that. So my point is that a permission fraction can help, can solve a lot of problems uh, related to trust in the fintech and insurance sector. And if there is a good solution, it should come up and it should be implemented. But similarly, a non-permission, a public uh, blockchain can also solve this problem. It's just a matter of who can provide a better service to the end customer. Mm. Um, so a question to the audience. How many of you have heard of permission chains? How many of you are familiar with Hyperledger Fabric, for example? Has anyone here heard of permission chains? Maybe, okay, so about half the room. So with the permission chain, I think the things that businesses are really looking for is they don't want their transactions, their pricing especially, to be visible, right, to competitors, right? Uh, and there's a lot of intellectual property in your business model, how you, you, know, you set up all of your transactions, what the pricing is, what discounts you offer, and what discounts you offer for what reasons, bundles, things like this. So a lot of that information, if it were on a public chain, uh, you could use forensics and you could figure it out. So that's one of the pros of a private chain or a permission chain. Now when we say private, it's not really private in the traditional sense that you just have one group, or one company. You can have hundreds. And so how many of you are familiar with um, you know, the recent uh, Maersk Trade Lens uh, initiative, which has 95 different uh, large companies, governments. So that's a, a big initiative that was just recently announced for supply chain. Maersk is, they own about 20% of all shipping, you know, globally. And so they're trying to get all of their partners, and they've shown that they can reduce cost, this reconciliation, for example, uh, by about 40%. So David was talking about reconciliation. It's very expensive, very time consuming. So they can reduce costs by 40% by putting everything on a blockchain. Um, you may also have heard that Walmart is uh, working with all of its uh, leafy greens suppliers, um, and they're doing that because of food safety, right? If you have food and it's found to have uh, some kind of a virus or 
um, it's like food poisoning, for example, you want to quickly find which farms that came from. In China, this is a big issue, for example, with pigs, with chickens. Here in the US, you get a big problem with, uh, with vegetables. Um, so, so these are some of the reasons that you know, people go for um, you know, uh, these permission chains. Public chains are, are very good in terms of being potentially more decentralized. Um, so there's pros and cons. So a next question that I would like to ask everyone uh, on the panel is, so businesses are starting to adopt uh, blockchain technology and, and they're doing it for real business reasons like we've talked about. Um, but is blockchain also a threat to these businesses that are joining these consortia? And so Satya, what are your thoughts on that? I really think blockchain is a threat for the businesses, especially for some of the old school businesses that have sort of maintained status quo, but that has always been the case. I think what some of the big enterprises are waiting for, and that's based on my experience talking to these clients, is they really want to see a good use case that creates value for both them and the customer implemented and they are ready to sort of start sprinting in that. So they don't want to be the first mover, but they do want to jump in as soon as there is a clear use case developed. So I think there is a threat, they know that, and they're all looking at it. They have not openly jumped into the pool yet. So I'll say really quickly that um, I think what's disruptive and, and potentially a threat, an existential threat, if you will, for particularly large centralized organizations, um, the large centralized organizations that are very capital heavy, um, particularly in supply chain and logistics and so on, um, if you think about Amazon or, or Walmart, there's, it's a very great example of an enormous centralized structure. Uh, they own the entire chain and that's why they're able to achieve such high efficiencies and productivity across the chain. But if you're looking at what's really disruptive across that in, in blockchain is the ability to achieve that sense of scale and efficiency without being centralized. So I think that from a threat point of view, I think that blockchain is very th threatening to those kinds of companies. Uh, the newer models of being completely decentralized and very lean in an organizational structure and yet be able to achieve scale and efficiency is, is really pretty threatening to some of the large centralized organizations. Uh, that's really well put. So I agree, you know, I don't claim that I know specifically who will be disrupted, but anyone where you're, you know, like a middleman, you want to be looking very carefully at what you're doing. So if you look at the internet, and it's not an exact mapping, but if you look at the internet, there's things like a travel agency. There used to be one on every high street. And now, well, why do I even need those? I only needed them because they had the terminal that could connect them to the, the booking systems of the airlines. Now, I don't need that, right? I have the internet. Now, to your point, right, we need, we will have industries that will just go away. Um, you know, one I, I like to pick on is um, credit reference agencies. So if you think of what they do, they take data on customers from credit card companies, essentially, and they store it. And then they sell that data to credit card companies to give ratings to people. And their only job is to keep that data safe. And you know, it turns out they don't always do the best job in that. So, but, but if you look at why do they even exist, it does seem crazy. I've deliberately made it sound, sound ridiculous, but why do they exist? Well, they exist because you've got a whole group of people who need this data collectively, and they rely on it, their businesses rely on it, knowing whether you're a, a good risk or a low risk. Well, there was no technology to share that data efficiently before, so these centralized agencies built up, just like the travel agencies built up. So it's not just a pick on that, but there's many, many businesses and industries that just rely on that fact that we don't have good mechanisms, trusted mechanisms to share data um, for their existence. So I, I think we will see a lot of disruption. It's gonna be kind of excited to watch. Chandler? <coughs> Forget about it. Uh, Forget about the blockchain, you know? Focus, stay focused on Bitcoin, <laughs> okay? 
don't waste your time on this uh, or all kind of this uh, conference. You know, you spend a lot of time on the conference, but you don't uh, cost your time focused on the real thing. You know, only Bitcoin by one, you, you make money, you, you become a millionaire, but you just uh, talk, study a lot of the blockchain story. It's not your business, you know, it's not your business. Even the, you think about a big company like Apple. Trillion dollar company. It's their business, you know. Google is a bin their business, not a your business, okay? For a lot of entrepreneurs, if you do the blockchain technology, so what? You change the world better place, so what? Not your business, okay? For you, you should do just do one thing. Every month when you get a salary, buy one Bitcoin, okay? <laughs> That's all. Keep buying and go to 100 Bitcoin and retire. That's all. Quick and fire your boss, you know. Find a, find a place with your family. Spend, spend spend time with your family. Don't spend time on this conference. Or what kind of a conference like this, you know? Blockchain technology, non business. Okay, it's oh, it Bitcoin price not keep growing like that, like it to the moon, you know. Nothing change. Blockchain is bullshit. Bitcoin will be a million dollar, and the blockchain may be some story, but for only for big company, not for, only for Chinese company, for like the Tencent and Alibaba, or Baidu, or here like Google, Amazon, or Facebook, Microsoft. For big company, maybe it's okay for them. They, but you know, no government like in the world welcome the Bitcoin. They don't like Bitcoin. Because if you have Bitcoin in your own wallet, you have your, you have your, real. You don't need to pay tax. It's it's belong to you. It's yours. It's belong to you. You know. It's not like your fair currency. So no no government like that. And oh, people like people today talk about blockchain. If you keep with the time on the blockchain, one year later, two years later, you will be, you will be know what I'm talking about. Okay. So for me, I just uh, uh, waste uh, my time. In here, in, in you know, to tell you, keep telling you to buy one Bitcoin. But maybe after this conference, when you go home, you do nothing. You know, you do nothing. You don't. You, you don't just. You just want buy one Bitcoin. Don't you, you? don't want. You just. You you just don't want. You just don't want to buy. You know. That's all. Okay. Well, thank you, Chandler. I'm done. Yeah. I, I think we're out of time, but I think you have two points of view here, right? We have um, a B2B world, B2B world where blockchain has particular uses and token, you know, coins are not yet, uh, you know, being accepted. And then you have the consumer world, right? And Chandler's talking very much about the consumer world. And in the consumer world, you have a clear use case of Bitcoin and it's a store of value. And they're very different worlds. And the B2C world and the B2B world have been very separate. And you know, you can see that here in Silicon Valley with B2B companies like Oracle and SAP and Cisco and, and others. And those are the large companies. And obviously Google you know, has a, a B2C part, but they make most of their money on the B2B part. And then you have the B2C side, right, as well, like Facebook and uh, Yahoo, you know, prior, and obviously Apple is selling a lot to, uh, to consumers. So they're very different kinds of business models. They have very different kinds of needs, different communities. Um, so I think the consensus on the panel is that, you know, Chandler is talking about Bitcoin for B2C, and we're talking about uh, permission chains uh, for B2B. Uh, I don't know if we have any more time for questions, but uh, that is it for the panel, and um, we hope that you enjoyed that.